You know, friends, it is very exciting to sit in a pulpit or stand in one and look at a large congregation. What you're seeing is an assemblage of beautiful faces because all human faces cast in the image of God are beautiful. And I often say to myself, what are all these good friends thinking about? Or are they thinking of anything? What goes on in all the minds out there in front? And then you say to yourself, I've got to get up there and say something to those people that will help them. That's the only reason in the world for preaching. And if you don't help people, then you might as well forget it. So I want to ask you today, what are you looking at? And to suggest that it would be very wise to open your eyes to opportunity. But instead, are you looking at trouble? Is that what you see? Have, your, have you your eyes opened to all kinds of negative aspects? Are your eyes open to hope or to despair? Now, this is a problem with all human beings. Some time ago, a schoolman from the deep south in the United States telephoned me and told me that he was a teacher of personality concepts, which was a new one on me but I rather liked it. And he said, would I be willing to speak to the junior high school in his town, to the sixth, seventh, and eighth grades over the telephone? He said they would rig up an amplification system in the school auditorium and for me to talk to them for 15 minutes and then allow another half hour for questions. And I said, well, that's 45 minutes. Well, he said, couldn't I spare that to help these kids? Well, I said, they don't know me. He said, yes, they do. I've told them who you are. Now, he said, we live in a depressed area where there are more broken families than I ever heard of being anywhere else. And children are distressed by broken families unless they've been properly handled. And said he, the financial condition here is very bad and these youngsters are hopeless and they're acting according to their depressed feelings. I want you to give them some positive thinking and open their eyes to opportunity. That's where I got the title for the sermon. So I agreed to do it and I talked for maybe 10 minutes. And then he said, hold it up. There's a question. And a nice little girl came on and she said, my mother and father fought all the time and then daddy walked out. And my mother is broken hearted. I want to get married sometime and have some babies. Do you think my marriage will go the same way? 
And then later on, a boy came on. He said, you have no idea how poor my family is, and they don't care. And I'm the only one who's gone as far as a junior high school, but I've got some ambition. I want to do something. I want to make enough money that my family will never have poverty anymore. Do you think there's any chance of my doing it? So I said, son, the greatest men in the United States came out of poverty. They began with nothing, including the present president of the United States. So hang in there and believe in Jesus Christ, all of you. Now, you're not supposed to talk that way in the public schools. It's against the Constitution. But the law doesn't apply to a minister talking from his study. That's the way I interpret it. <laughs> so you see, open your eyes to opportunity. Don't fix them upon those difficulties which seem to be hopeless. Now, the good Lord wants you to have life. That is a great message of the Christian faith. He came that you might have life. He himself gives to you life and breath and every good thing. That's the way the New Testament talks. The other morning, I awakened in my hotel in Albuquerque, New Mexico before dawn. I was on the 14th floor. There was no building to obstruct my view. I was looking out over the vast Pueblo country of New Mexico, some of the most ancient land in the United States first peopled by the Indians and the Spaniards. Romantic history seemed to flow from those plains. There was a vast escarpment of a mountain range hid in the gloom of early morning. But it seemed like somebody was building a fire behind this mountain for I could see a low-hung ray of light. And as I watched this fire mounted higher and higher and higher until it burst over the top of the mountain, flooding the plain with undulating light and glory, and the whole sky was pink and beautiful. And the thought occurred to me, thinking of the Pueblo Indians, how many mornings has the sun come up over the plains and mountains of New Mexico. And here was a, another day, and I was watching its birth. Then it seemed to me that God just took that morning and hurled it at my feet. And he said, here, son, is a glorious, precious thing. I'm giving you a new day, February 20th, 1981. What are you going to do with it? <laughs> uh, what did I do with it? <laughs> what are we going to do with this day? God gives you life and breath and every good thing. You open your eyes 
such an opportunity and life will be incredibly good. For example, suppose you're not feeling very well. Uh, suppose you're sick. S suppose you got all kinds of aches and pains. Uh, and you say, well, when you begin to get along this age, that's what you got to settle for. Why do you have to settle for it? What age in life means that you're no longer vital, vigorous, and healthy? The Bible that was read in your hearing this morning told us that in him we live and move, that means energy, and have our being. If you open your eyes to the opportunity for energy, vigor, fullness of life, he's there to give it to you because he promises you life and breath and every good thing. And there are some people who find it. For example, some months ago, I checked in to a hotel in Chicago at about 10 o'clock in the morning to speak to a convention of a national business association at its noontime luncheon. And I was assigned to a beautiful suite and the suite was all made up. Nobody had occupied it the night before. So I was sitting in my suite, thinking about my speech, when there came a rap at the door, and before I could say come in, the door opened, and the maid came in. Now this maid had to be 65 years of age. Later she told me she was over that. But she said, is your room all right, sir? Are you happy in it? Well, it said, ma'am, I've only been here about five or 10 minutes, but <laughs> it, it seems to be all right. Well, she said, you know, I want all my people who occupy my rooms to be happy. So do you mind if I go around tidy things up a little bit? No, I said they look all right to me, but if you think they need tidying up, you go right ahead. So she had a cloth and a kind of a brush, and she went around. Then she began humming, and my ear picked it up. What a friend we have in Jesus. And she went from that into a, another hymn or two. And I said to her, ma'am, you sound like a Christian. Oh, do I? She said, well, bless your soul. <laughs> That's exactly what I am. Her beautiful ebony face shone with the glory of God. And I, I loved her. I said, well, ma'am, we're brothers and sisters. Oh, she said, are you a Christian too? <laughs> As if to say, you don't look it. <laughs> she said then to me, isn't Jesus wonderful? Yes, I said, he is, but why do you say it? Oh, she said, I, I went through so much sickness, so much pain, so many aches, and so much trouble. And then I found him. And you know what he did for me? He not only saved my soul, he changed my whole 
mentality, and he changed my physical body. And she said, sir, I want to tell you something, and this is why I put this story in. He, she says, the older I get, the better I feel. Then's when I said to her, how old are you, ma'am? She says, isn't that a nosy question? <laughs> she said, I'll venture, I'm older than you are. I said, you lose. <laughs> now, you know, if Almighty God can make people like that, why don't we let ourselves be made a person like that? It's simple, isn't it? If the good Lord can do this for one person, he can do it for another. Now, what did she have that uh, made it possible for her to be that way? She had just turned to the Creator and to his son who finishes the job that the Creator may not have finished. In other words, the Creator made her, and then she didn't live right, and the Son of the Creator has the same marvelous alchemy in his touch. And he made her to have opportunity so don't go around looking at ill health sickness weakness arthritis or what have you these things are real sir william osler the greatest physician in the british history says to his students Ask not what disease the patient has, but why the patient has the disease, which is medicine in its profoundest. We become sick because of what we are. And another distinguished French doctor said, when a person dies, he does not totally die from the disease. He dies from what his total life was. So if you keep your total life in the knowledge and love of God, then you have vibrant vibrant health oh yes open your eyes the opportunity to what uh, life can be get excited about it feel the vibrations that come everywhere from this dynamic universe spring is now coming so way ahead of time in february maybe march will intervene a bit you never can tell about march <laughs> but life is emerging once again in all of nature and life in the individual he emerges if he has his eyes open to opportunity. On my recent uh, speaking trip, to which I referred a moment ago, I was taking a walk with my wife who was with me, and we passed a beautiful barber shop. And uh, it was so attractive that I said to my wife, do you, do you think I need a haircut? <laughs> and she said, well, yeah, you'd look better if you had one. So she said, I'll walk around here and look at the shops while you get a haircut. I didn't like that idea too much. But, 
But I went in and I said to the nice girl, they were all dressed in pick and span white, like nurses. I said, I would like to have a haircut, only a haircut, nothing but a haircut, because I know how barbers uh, get these extras. In. And she, she said, uh, she turned a pencil and looked at the time chart. I said, no, if I can't have it now, I, I don't want it. Can I have it now? And she said, yeah, I guess so. You can have it now. I said, thank you very much, ma'am. I only want a haircut. How long will that take me? She said, Tell 10 or 15 minutes. I said to my wife, you've got 10 or 15 minutes. So the girl took me back, put a thing all over me, sat me down in a strange looking chair. Didn't look like a barber chair at all. And I said, this is a funny kind of a chair. Well, she said, just sit there. And so I sat and then the chair reclined and I was lying almost straight out and I thought, how in the world could she cut my hair in this position? <laughs> then I felt water all over my head. I said, what are you doing to me, ma'am? She said, giving you a shampoo. I said, I don't want a shampoo. She said, the rules of the house are you have to have a shampoo. <laughs> oh, I thought, okay, it won't hurt. So I had the shampoo. Then she got me out of the chair and took me into another chair where there was a man. And he had a regulation barber chair. And uh, this man said, good morning, sir. Isn't this a terrific morning? He said, I hope you feel happy with a day like this. I said, yes, I feel very happy, but I did not want a shampoo. <laughs> He said, sit right down here. He says, you didn't want a shampoo. Uh, I said, no. He said, we give everybody a shampoo before we work on their hair because their hair responds more perfectly to our treatment if it has been washed. I said, well, isn't that great? He said, besides, our business isn't merely to cut people's hair. Our business is to work with the personality. We want all of our customers to walk out of this shop looking up at the sun, happy and positive in their outlook. And he said, in order to do that, you got to give them a shampoo. <laughs> But, said he, it would be better if we could shampoo the inside of the head. Then he said we'd wash out all those miserable old thoughts that keep them from the enjoyment and delight of life. He said we want our people to walk out of this shop clean inside and clean outside. I said, you know something, sir? You and I are in the same business. I said, I've got a shop down on Fifth Avenue in New York City <laughs> where we do exactly the same thing. Only, I added, probably we don't get as much money for it <laughs> as you do. And he said to me, what's your name? <laughs> I told him. He said, I got my ideas from listening to you or reading you. <laughs> then he offered me a free haircut, but I turned it down. <laughs> That's it. You come into a place like this, carrying your burdens, carrying your anxieties, carrying your hates, carrying your sins. And the great expert washes them all away. And then you go outside with your eyes open to opportunity. And God bless you, everyone. 
Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your wonderful faith, your magnificent teachings that tell us again and again what life can be filled with glorious, exciting, marvelous opportunity. Help us to grasp it fully and praise the Lord forevermore through Jesus Christ, thy Son. Amen.